My topic tonight is, a, is I had to ask Daya and Keshe what it was supposed to be, not that I didn't know the words, the culture of Ananda, but I couldn't figure out what, what we were trying to accomplish with this. Um, now I do understand, but the first thing I would say is that the music, Swamiji's music, is probably the linchpin of the culture of Ananda. So the fact that now um, all of you are beginning to learn it and sing it and become more at home with it and so on is... It's no small part of. Mm -hmm. It's no small part of being a disciple of this path. I think I, you know all of these topics are just a sort of random way of beginning to talk about the same things because all we're ever talking about is how to love God and how to be attuned to God and try to understand how to do that better. In uh, in the book that I've just published about Swamiji, there's many different. Uh, incidents described and stories told and all of them uh, with a very specific purpose which is to help people understand not only what he did but why he did it, what he was thinking. Really that book is an attempt to explain the culture of Ananda because Ananda is the expression of Swami Kriyananda's discipleship. And not for the sake of, oh, this is all a personality cult around Swami Kriyananda, but um, what it means to be a disciple of this particular path at this particular time is not <clears throat> as obvious uh, as we think it might be. Because this is a new yuga that we're moving into, and a great deal of what we all know about spirituality, both East and West, has all been formed by this, these two cycles of Kali Yuga, descending and ascending, and all of the um, burden that has been placed upon spirituality by the heaviness of the material world at that point. You'll have to forgive me if I say something in this room that I've already said before, because I've been talking every day in several different places. And I try to keep it straight, but I can't always keep it straight. I think I did actually say this in this room, that when I was first living in my little fantasy of an Indian village, and yes, it was in this room I was talking about, when I came to India for the first time, I realized that Master's expression was neither East nor West, that he came to innovate, as avatars often do. You know, Jesus came as a Jew. He was Jewish. All his disciples were Jewish. He was a rabbi. He spoke in the temple. Um, in the end, it was... His, his own people who um, wanted his teaching to be stopped, not because they were Jews, but because they were a corrupt priesthood, and he was going to undermine the power that they developed for themselves, and so he was uh, condemned by a corrupt priesthood because he came to reform the, the religion, but he came to those people because they had the, the, the true longing for God. And so in the same way Master has come, I don't even know if reform is exactly the, the right word because we're not so much dealing with corruption, although corruption exists, as what we're dealing with is just, um, how would you say, it's become too externalized. The, the essential reality of inner communion with God, spirituality has been lost to religion, is basically what's happened here. This afternoon, uh, I had an interview with someone from the speaking tree, and she was asking questions about all the religious bigotry and factionalism that we see these days. And I was just saying, it has nothing, it has nothing to do with God. It's just small-minded people finding a way to exercise their small-mindedness. The mere fact that they're using words related to religion has nothing to do with religion. They could call themselves anything they wanted to do, it's, it's uh, bigotry and cruelty and unkindness and lack of compassion is not the way of God, period. So we don't have to be taken in by any of this. So Master came really to innovate all this. That's what he said. The, the great masters of the Himalayas, the great masters of the world who are actually the people who run this planet, which is really very comforting because the people who appear to run the planet are highly unqualified to be running the planet. And it would make us all really nervous if we actually thought that they really were in charge. They're really hardly qualified to run a small ice cream store. You know, it's just like they're way beyond their portfolio. But 
somehow Divine Mother is, is running a story and that story is um, the necessary chaos that often precedes a, a, a rebirth. And Master predicted it emphatically, warned us that it was coming and encouraged us to go deep into the spirit because the more insecure the material world becomes, the more necessary it is for us to have a deep inner reality. And even though we consider this chaotic external time to be some kind of a curse, is it actually better to live in times where there's no incentive to grow, where everybody's just so comfortable that we just live the same dull life, you know, for, from the beginning to the end and nothing ever happens? Is that actually a more victorious life than one in which we are constantly having all our delusions exploded and being forced to rise to a new challenge? It's just, it's very interesting how all this works. Well, Ananda is, I believe, without wanting to become too mm, puffed up in self-importance about it, I think Ananda is an extremely part, uh, important part of what uh, our, our world is doing right now. Swamiji, who was not at all inclined toward self-importance or having too grandiose an idea of things, um, on many occasions made the simple statement that he believes that history will show that the most important thing going on right now is Ananda. Um, the communities that we have, in uh, mostly now in America and one in Europe, the communities that we have, the lifestyle we're developing, the way that we're practicing spiritual life, um, the friendships that we're building, the basis of how we're living, he, he's made the statement that this is, Master said, the lifestyle of the future. It's a very interesting comment because there's certainly no sign of it, of, of anybody actually caring about us on that level. A friend of mine did historical research about the time of William, William the Conqueror in England, when he, who was master in a previous lifetime. Swamiji was his son, Henry the First. Uh, William's primary confidant was a monk who was the bishop who was called Lanfranc, and Lanfranc was Sri Teshwar. And then when Henry became king, his confidant was a priest also who was, who was Rajasi, who was Anselm. So you have the whole crew back there at that time. <laughs> and probably a number of us were part of that story one way or another too, although you know it's hard to know all of those things. Well, my friend did a little bit of research. And Lanfranc, at the time that Lanfranc lived, the church itself was exceedingly corrupt. And many of the monasteries were, were, were hedonistic places of abuse of many, on many different levels. And uh, it, it, it was sort of like there they were always sincere people, but the public face of the church was quite degenerate. But then there was Lanfranc, who was, of course, a, an avatar. And he started a small monastery, 12 monks, in a place called Cluny, which I might have been in Ireland or England. I'm not quite sure where it was. I, I keep forgetting to find out where it was. But it was either France, Ireland, England, or somewhere there. But it was somewhere in that world. There were 12 monks, and they were very sincere monks. And they started living a genuine spiritual life. What they were doing gradually became so attractive that they started several other houses. As those houses began to develop, the monks had more time and energy for other creative pursuits. They developed music, they developed visual art, they developed sculpture, they developed architecture, and then gradually they developed more and more of these spiritual hubs. And my friend just charted this all down. The entire culture of, of that part of Europe and the entire Catholic Church, in a, in a straight line from 12 monks in a monastery started by Lanfranc, by Sri Teshwar, it all just went in a straight line from there. Now it took a few hundred years, but when you traced it back, it all came from where there was genuine inspiration and the power of an avatar. Um, it was a, a different era, of course, than this one, but what is the important point to understand is the, the world's power is ephemeral. 
And even though it appears to have more energy than we do right now, um, divine power is eternal. And worldly power just burns itself out and then goes away. You know, in, 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 in India, especially when I was first coming here, and I think Swami launched the Bhagavad Gita book or something like this, still in India you can get national leaders to endorse spiritual things. Those of us who are from America were just absolutely amused at the idea of being able to go to Washington, D.C. and have national business leaders or national politicians you know, come to endorse the Bhagavad Gita or, I mean, it was just, it made us just chuckle. It was out of the question. It was touching that, you know, nationally known figures would be inspired for one reason or another to do it. So you guys are still a lot better off than we are. <laughs> but nonetheless, when you walk down the street, you, you don't see the culture of Ananda. You see something quite different. When I was talking to Swamiji once about we were just lamenting, <clears throat> I was lamenting about the low state of consciousness of early Dwapara Yuga. And jokingly, I said to Swamiji, please, sir, the next time you incarnate, choose a higher Yuga. <laughs> Don't make us come back to one like this again. Swami's first response, because at that time he was in extremely, uh, he was extremely disinclined. Uh, he had a strong sense of vairagya for this world. So the first thing he said was, I do not intend to come back at all. <laughs> By the end of his life, he'd, so he's sort of like this, ah, I know myself. He said, I know I'll have to come back to help you all. I said, well, that's good news, sir. I said, that's the only reason you came this time, isn't it? He said, well, yes, there is that, isn't it? <laughs> so he'd already done it, and he will do it again. But then he said, the higher yugas, he said, are still the material plane. It's not like, it's not the astral world, it's not the causal world, it's still the material plane. He said, um, but in the higher yugas, the way he put it was, people like us are in charge. And I said, so the whole world operates like Ananda. He said, yes. Well, that was such a lovely thought. You know, friendship and trust and kindness and mutual respect and devotion to God. Wouldn't it be nice? if the whole world were like that. And then a lot of these lower consciousness people would just be on some other planet that suited them better. <laughs> and they wouldn't come and torment our planet quite so much. So we have to start by understanding that we're not in tune with the times. It's just we're not. And even though we have an obligation to make our message known, I mean, Master set the example and he advertised and he you know, tried to get people to come, and he did not just sit like Lahiri did and just meditate in his living room and not let people even do anything in his name. He let the perfume of Kriya itself draw people. Master took a very different tact. And actually, Master was criticized for doing it. See, all of these things are sort of lost, but even his guru, Sri Yukteswar, wondered about some of the things he, he'd heard that Master was doing because he was using modern advertising methods. And he had a manager for a period of time who, you know, who really put him forward as this sort of uh, ma magical magician from India and played up the exotic and all of that. And was this really a, uh, was this being true to Sanatana Dharma? Master defended himself by saying, if the chewing gum company can advertise their good flavors of chewing gum. He said, I think I can encourage, I can advertise good ideas for people to chew on. That's how he put it. So it's not a sense of the world needs to be saved, but it's a sense that we have something that's very worthwhile and it's not appropriate for us to keep it secret. You know, see, it's a very different. So we, we, we present it, we share it, and then it's an invitation but we have to put out some energy to make that invitation. But the idea that we would actually be in tune with what mass culture is doing, um, Michael Jackson, who of course was known in America, known all over the world before his reputation you know, took a, a, such a, a downward dive, but at the time when he was at the height of his, public, of his fame, some of the teenagers in our community found out that Swami Kriyananda had never heard, I think had never heard of him, and had also never heard any of his music. So they felt that this was a, a, 
a gap in his education that they were obligated to uh, uh, fill. So they we made some extracts from some of his songs and gave them to Swami to listen to. And Swamiji uh, um, never hid from the world. He didn't feel, he didn't have a sort of scornful, it's beneath me to consider attitude. In fact, he put, as he put it, as the leader of an international organization, he was obligated to pay attention. He had a lot of responsibility he needed to know. He wasn't in Him Himalayan yogi. So he dutifully listened to whatever, a few of these songs, and his response was extremely interesting. The first thing he said about him, he said, he's a, he's a superb artist. He says he knows, uh, he knows exactly what he wants to say, and he says it perfectly. Which is, you know, it was a very interesting comment. You know, he's, he, he, whether Swami shared his vision or not was quite something different. But he could tell this man had a vision and that he was a master at executing it. And he said, and his vision, his vibration, is how Swami put it, his vibration exactly matches the world culture at this time. Which is why everyone in the world was, was drawn to him. Because, it, you know, it wasn't even the style of the music or anything, but he, but he vibrated at a certain attitude and state of consciousness, which was exactly the vibration of the world. So he moved right out, and everybody recognized him as what they wanted. And also, because music not only reflects consciousness, it also creates it. So his fame actually reinforced that consciousness. It's very interesting, which is why our music, Swami's music, is so important because it not only reflects, it also creates consciousness. And it creates our consciousness, and it creates consciousness in others. I'll come back to that. So Swami talking about Michael like that way, but then Swami said, and listening to his music also tells me, speaking of himself, Swami said, that I am completely out of tune with this world. <laughs> he said, completely. You know, my vibration is, is, has nothing to do with the world as it is right now. And when uh, a, an, uh, one of the, a national publisher became enamored of Swami personally, Swamiji personally, and wanted to make him a big popular figure, um, the, the actress Jane Fonda had become uh, big in the yoga movement, and her fame had been created by the same publisher. So he thought he could make Swami the Jane Fonda of meditation. <laughs> Swami had to ask someone, you know, like as if, if, as if it was another language, what is he talking about? <laughs> so he didn't even know what he was talking about. So others filled Swami in on the whole thing like that. And Swami was willing in the sense that this had come to him. Swami was always open. And, and he liked the man himself. There was a, I think the whole thing was about Swamiji meeting this man and this man meeting Swamiji. He liked him. We all liked him. He was, a, he was sort of one of us, even though he only, the, the publisher only touched in and then floated away. But he'd come to Swami, so he thought he would try. But in all honesty, Swami felt he had to warn the publisher. He said, I am the kind of author, I'm the kind of artist, really, who becomes popular long after he's dead. <laughs> now, it was an interesting way to put it, but what Swami was really saying is, I am not for this time. And what I am doing is not for this time. What I am doing is planting deep seeds for the time that's coming. Because part of what makes that time come is that the vibration is building. The vibration is building like this. And, and so when we're working and even living our own lives for our own, for our own selves, you know, it's, but, but when, when let, me, let me get back to where I am with this. With the, with the doing of Ananda, it's, it's more like, well, I think of it this way. I'm, I've been living in the Palo Alto community there since 1987, and continuously. It's been my home all that time. And during that time, we've managed to get a temple, and we've started a school for children. Uh, we have an established community. We've, we've done, we've created a little enclave of, of master's energy. And our school, especially as a tremendous challenge. It's, well, it's not quite as tough as it is in India in terms of how incredibly rigid and fear-driven the educational system is, but it's, uh, 
it's certainly not easy, especially not in the Palo Alto area across from Stanford University, which is exactly where our school is. And so we've established our, we're just working on our nine through 12, but our um, kindergarten through eight is pretty solid. We have about 75 students. We're like 28, almost 30 years old there. You know, we've, we've actually graduated people and have them not be damaged and be successful, you know, who go on. I'm joking, but you know, the fear of parents is very intense when you do anything outside of it. So we've had several cycles, actually probably only two major ones, where the whole school is almost imploded for some reason or another. Usually just something happens. Either you have a very disgruntled parent who manages to encourage others, or in, in a couple of times we've had disgruntled teachers who you know, and so the whole thing just kind of goes like this for a little while, and we don't really know what's going to happen. And the three of us who have been core to it, two of them are teachers, and I as sort of the support from the outside, we all just say to ourselves, we ask ourselves every time, you know, do we feel that we are doing what Swamiji wants us to do, that we're acting in tune with Master, that we're sincerely acting um, for the sake of are we, are, we, are, we, are we expressing the true vibration of what this teaching is? And as long as we feel that our vibration is what it is supposed to be, then whatever else happens on the outside, it really doesn't matter. Because we're, we're not really doing, this is not just for now. This is for the flow of energy that we're working with. So coming back to the actual you know, the way this has been phrased, what is the culture of Ananda? Part of the culture of Ananda is that we have chosen to incarnate at a time when the yugas are ascending. And that has a, a really, really strong impact on our spiritual lives. When Jesus lived, and it, Jesus being closely connected to our path, Swamiji at the end of his life was saying that he believed that Jesus was a previous incarnation of Master, which uh, when, during Master's lifetime, he never said that. He did say his teaching was the second coming of Christ. But when Swami asked him directly if he had, was an incarnation of Jesus, reincarnation, Master said, what difference would it make? I said, Swamiji, why didn't Master speak about it more openly? Swami said, Master had so much trouble in America. Can you imagine what would have happened if he said that? <laughs> and I said, hmm, good point, sir. <laughs> you know, it's not something that, there was, it was way too early. But if, you know, any of us were there with Jesus or whoever was with Jesus, it was Kali Yuga descending. I mean, it was so bad that they crucified the avatar. I mean, this is not a high age when the avatar is crucified. This happens every once in a while, but it's not a, it's not a great moment. It's nothing to be proud of when your civilization crucifies the avatar. It's a bad, it's a bad time. And it got worse. You know, they... they through all the other Christians to the lions as time went on. So there was like, there was no reforming society at this point. You know, there was no point in trying to found a community and build a temple and write books and make all this happen because it was just, you know, going down and getting worse. So the people who were serious left. They went to monasteries, they went to caves, they went out into the desert. They just left, left society behind which I think that's kind of a nice situation. Those are, I think those are good lives when you can just concentrate on your spiritual life, isolate yourself with your fellow devotees, and, and just turn your back on the world. I mean, it's very tempting to do that. But this whole path started with Lahiri Mahashaya being drawn to the Himalayas where Babaji says, oh, here is your folded blanket, here is your water pot, I've saved these things through you all this time, I've watched you through these incarnations, my own you have returned to me. And Lahiri is, you know, as the story is told, which is the, the self-realized masters play their parts. And they, they live their parts. It's a very subtle and difficult thing to quite understand, but they live their parts. So Lahiri thinks, there's my blanket, there's my you know, water pot. I'm done. I, you can imagine he was not thinking about the fact that he needed to get down the mountain because he had to get to work the next day. That was not the first thing he was thinking. He, I, he was probably not thinking about any of it. He just forgot that it was all there. He's reunited with his guru in this lifetime and 
He probably, and he probably just assumed that that was it. But that wasn't it. It was he just receives his initiation and then he goes back into that life. So the first movement of this whole path is the most sort of ordinary, not really, but ordinary appearing integrated life, which is completely different than how we've all been thinking spiritual dedication should look. Of course, householder saints were not unprecedented, but they were definitely not the model. And so Lahiri starts that. Sri Yukteswar, you know, by the time he appears on the scene, is a Swami, but he was also married and raised a daughter. And he didn't you know, renounce the world until after his wife had died and his daughter was married. So he too just ran through this, this whole cycle. Master, of course, lived differently. But nonetheless, it's just like it's being imposed upon us a wholly different picture. And, it, and therefore, it's a very different challenge. It's not the challenge of being able to blank the slate and, and put our attention on God. It's the problem of living through this very messy world. And, and it doesn't mean that we all just get to marry nicely and have a tidy little home and all the money we need uh, or anything like that. It's death, destruction, divorce, chaos, bankruptcy. You know, it's just, it's nothing is working out. And yet, we're compelled to stay in it. We're, we're not given the freedom to just blank the slate. We're asked to bring our spirituality into the world that we're living in now, but we, we live a little differently. So, our, and it, we're doing it because it's our karma. We chose to incarnate at this time because this is precisely what we need to learn. If the lesson for us was how to live in a cave, we'd get to live in a cave. But the obvious lesson for us, for one reason or another, is to figure out how spiritual life and, and life actually unite in some way and how we can hold our dedication and our consciousness of God in the midst of so many distractions. You know, in the midst of this city, in the midst of the city that I live in. It's not that we never get a retreat or never get an ashram life, but it's, it's different. And worse than that, well, I was going to say in addition to that, worse than that, is because Master came to start a spiritual revolution. I mean, that's what his job was. He's starting a spiritual revolution. He launched a spiritual revolution. Autobiography of a Yogi was published in 1946. I mean, books usually, within a very short time, just go away. It's still a bestseller. I mean, what kind of power is in that book? I mean, we, we can speak to it, but just think about that, that this book just keeps being read. And it keeps being read more and more, and it gets translated into whatever it is. Somewhere I read 52 languages. I don't, I'm not sure whether I just made that up or I actually saw it somewhere. It's in all these different languages. I mean, even as we speak, there are undoubtedly hundreds, thousands of people picking up autobiography and reading it for the first time. And that's Master's just living presence walking through that. Swami Kriyananda was one of his foremost disciples, and he pulled all of us into this story. And we have a job, you know, and the job is our, our living discipleship. And the second job is this, you know, building this, because people need to see that there's another way to do it. When, when I was writing that book about Swamiji, it's, it's 44 years that I knew him. Every year is a chapter. Yeah, you know, every chapter is a year except for the first, which is a few years together. Just one by one by one in everything he did. And what I was wanting to put across is what it looks like these days to be a disciple. You know, and it just doesn't look like this whitewash sort of thing. And the other aspect of it, you know, talking again of the culture of Ananda, is that Swamiji is so informal and at ease with all of this. I know there's a lot of Indian customs that I respect, you know. When Swami first came here in 2003, he brought with him conversations with Yogananda, which uh, he wanted published immediately here, which was published, we did publish it very, you know, very quickly. And uh, he, he was, a number of people told him he simply couldn't call that book Conversations with Yogananda. He had to call it com conversations with 
Paramahansa Yogananda Sri Sri 1008 Maharaj Ji, you know, that it was just out of the question for him to call it conversations with Yogananda because there was all this other stuff that just had to be put around it. And there was some actual conversation about conversations, you know, about how that was going to go. And Swami's comment was, enough already. You know, conversations with Yogananda is enough. Now, it was a small thing in a certain way, but it was also part of what he was just trying to say. Let's just take away everything that's not essential. You know, Swami's respect for his guru, there is no question about it. It didn't need to be decorated with a lot of Sri Sri's for anybody to be able to see it. It's a, it was a very small thing and symbolic only in the smallest way. But nonetheless, there it was. He was also just saying to us, this is the time for inner communion. This is the time when everybody looks like everybody, but we're different inside. Many years ago, like in the early 70s, uh, at Ananda village when we were our, our little primitive ashram out there just beginning to come up, just beginning to get our heads above, you know, above the horizon line like this, um, one of the local papers was going to do a, a little story about us because we're in this rural county and we were kind of a big deal in a small place. In a very small place we looked big. So they came to uh, uh, do this and the reporter was there and I, I think I served lunch and we were talking. And the reporter was actually a little disappointed because he was hoping to find a very exotic place. He was hoping to find a lot of weird people walking around in strange costumes and intoning, you know, and, and he, would, he just met regular folk who looked like regular folk. And here he was having lunch with the, you know, with the, with the big Maha, although he wouldn't have known the Maha, Sri Sri 1008 sort of, because he was too American to know those concepts, but that was what he was hoping for. He was hoping for there would be a lot of ceremony. And when I was in Israel in uh, January of last year, we were there for, I don't know whether it was Russian Christmas or Armenian Christmas, I could never get clear. Maybe it was Russian Armenian Christmas or something. But it was, uh, I was actually at the, in Jerusalem at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is where Jesus was crucified where his body was laid out and where he was resurrected. It's all, with, it's all under one big roof in a relatively small place. But it was because it was this special holiday. Um, and, and then apparently the, the equivalent of the pope, or, the, or at least the bishop of Jerusalem, of that particular sect. And I don't want to make fun of this, but it was really something to see. They came there, and uh, most of the time it was relatively quiet. Well, it's not quiet in there because they're having masses all over the place. But all of a sudden, these several different kinds of Christianity share that building, that church. So they all take turns, you know, dominating the scene. So this was their turn because it was their day. These young men get up all of a sudden, and they're these big wooden drums. They start beating on these drums. I, I love drums, and so I loved it, even though I just surrendered. You know, this is not, a, this is not the time to do Kriya. <laughs> So I just, I just stood up and watched the show. They're whomping on these drums, this whomp, 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 fabulous wood sound just goes on and on. They're just going like this for quite some time. Then I hear coming from outside the building, there's a sound like, and it, what it turns out to be, and there, there are these two men, and they have dandas. I'm sure they didn't call them dandas, but they had these big sticks with something on top. It's all stone, and in rhythm with the drums, they're stepping forward, and they're both banging those sticks down on the ground. Then they take another step forward and they bang the sticks on the ground. So they're banging from inside, they're banging from outside with great rhythm. It wasn't cacophony, it was fantastic. They all sort of make their way all the way in. And then there's the guy, whoever he was, kind of a chubby guy with some kind of a thing like this and like this. And the whole thing you come right in through the front door, and right in the front door, I know some of you are coming soon on this pilgrimage, you come right in through the front door, there's this marble slab, and the, the story of Jesus is when, he, after he died on the cross, uh, St. John was there, and Mary Magdalene, and, and Jesus' mother, and uh, what was his name? Nicodemus, not Nicodemus, the, the disciple whose tomb it was. Nicodemus. It was Nicodemus, so they took him down, 
And they laid his body on this marble slab. And the marble slab is right there. Stone, not marble. It was just a stone because they were just outdoors. So that slab is right there. So you come in right through this front door and just about the last row of where these seats are. It's just about that far. Well, no, probably as far as the back wall. So all of these drumming here and the thump, 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 and they come all the way in like this and they get right to that point like this. And then the, the big guy goes down on his knees. As his knees hit the floor, all the, all the noise stops. I mean, it was fantastic, you know? <laughs> and I don't know who the guy was. Maybe he was really a spiritual person, but I found it a little hard to imagine that he was, with all that going on around him, I, I, it was hard for me to feel that he wasn't conscious of who he was, you know, in that position. It all stops. He prostrates himself, and they... Then he gets up, and then he stands, and they put his thing back on. Then the whole thing starts again while he goes over to the Holy Sepulchre. By that point, I'd lost interest, and I went back to the hotel. OK, having said all that, the reporter was hoping for something like that. Because right? you know? <laughs> I mean, that's good press, especially in America, especially for some weird little hippie commune out in the country. That's what they really wanted, because that's how people you know, if I'm, if I'm spiritually powerful, I'm powerful in the world. That's just how we expect it to be. And Swami, in those days, if it had been summer, he was probably in Bermuda shorts and a, and a Hawaiian print shirt. He never wore even formal uh, uh, sannyasi clothes except for very special occasions. We know normally, well, most of the time. And he certainly wouldn't have dressed that way for a reporter. You know, and he would have just walked up and shook his hand and I would have just been... We just, you know, serving, serving lunch and making jokes and, you know, just, it would have just been so natural. He was really disappointed because <laughs> he was hoping for some exotic story. So all of that is to say then the reporter says, says essentially in his own way that he was disappointed that I've come all the way out here and you're not weird. You seem perfectly normal. Fooey. And, uh, but then Swami said just very quietly, the reporter was not sensitive enough to know what Swami said. Oh, yes, yeah, Swami said, yes, we, we live just like everyone else, except we put God first. And, I mean, the reporter heard him, but it just went just like that. You know, because except we put God first. Like, who does that? Especially not if you're living just like everyone else. How do you live like everyone else if you put God first? And that is the culture of Ananda, which is we don't get to make ourselves feel spiritual by doing anything strange. Now, for 10 years now, since Swami started the Naya Swami order, which was now 2009, he, he initiated a number of us and put us in special costumes. And when he put us in special costumes, there was a lot of discussion about, about it. And I myself am of two minds about it. Personally, I, I love it. I, I love the fact that I love the fact that I, 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 I affirm within myself the fact that it shows on the outside. You know, most of the time in America, I dress pretty much. Oh, I always dress as I dress now in a sort of Indian tunic trouser sort of look. But in America, you can wear anything you want. And the only comment I usually get is, "My, that's a nice color." So. I, I know what I'm doing, but nobody knows what I'm doing. If I'm with several of my other Naya Swami friends, they think we're some kind of a club or something. Or occasionally, depending on what sports, <laughs> depending on what sports team is popular, you know. I mean, it was like four or five of us in the restaurant, and the waitress thought, "You must be L.A. Dodgers fans," you know. It was, it was baseball season, you know. We didn't quite know what to answer. Sure, why not? But, but the fact is. It distinguishes us. And we, we talked a lot to Swamiji, sir. We've, we've worked really hard to live just like everyone else, but to put God first, to not make people feel that you can externalize your spirituality and have it still be the same. So now you're asking us to do that. Is that really what you want us to do? And it was, we sort of went back and forth. Swami's answer to almost everything was that, quote, you should do as you feel because it is internal, it's not organizational. So we, we had, to, had to decide. And, but he also said he thought it was time now to make a more external statement. And he actually says, I think in the, 
I believe it's in the book he wrote about it, but he said, in time, you know, eventually the blue will be recognized for what it is. And it's not really Ananda. This is the, a reformation of the Shankaracharya order, so right now it's focused within Ananda, but it isn't Ananda. It happens to coincide, but it's not the definition of us. But for the first time, for the first time, it, was, it became possible to have an external way of distinguishing people, which I'm really sorry about. <laughs> you know, personally I'm pleased, but I'm really sorry about it. Because all of a sudden, we move from pure spirit into form. And so it's, you know, it's a very interesting reality because what we're trying to do is, is getting out of Kali Yuga. And Kali Yuga is all about form. If you have the right form, then you have the right substance. There's a, a comedian in America named Garrison Keillor who has kind of a dry wit. And one of, one of my favorite expressions about churchianity versus Christianity comes from him. He says, going, sitting in church, if you think sitting, if, he said, let's see, sitting in church and thinking that makes you a Christian is like going into your garage and thinking by sitting there you'll become a car, is how he put it. <laughs> and that's the essence of what Ananda is. You are what you are, but we have something that's uniquely powerful. And I'm going to come back to the music for a minute because it's interesting. You know, what, what we're doing is a vibration, and it's a ray. That's how Swami described it. it about not, in the early 80s, he wrote a little pamphlet, which may or may not still be around. I really don't know. It's called A New Dispensation. And Swami just, it's just about four pages, five pages. And uh, I quote from it in the book. I, I tried to sort of resurrect things that just, Swami just did so much, that so much of it was just enormous when it happened. And then just before the ink was dry, he did the next thing. And so you kind of lose track a little. I tried to chronicle it. But he was really talking about his, just uh, the, the, he was trying to introduce the fact that this is a ray of grace, was the words he used. And this is a particular vibration of consciousness that we're all trying to tune into. And, you know, the word attunement and being in tune gets talked about a lot. And the more it gets talked about, it's one of those things, the more these things get talked about, the harder they are to understand. But if you can, uh, because people try to put them into form, and, and then you get confused, but there's just, there is a, a vibration that Master passed through that we're trying to feel, and it's very, very subtle because it is not form. Being a self-realizationist is not an easy path because there's just, you can't get the rules straight. Yes, you, t you take Kriya, you say, I will practice Kriya faithfully and regularly as it is taught to me. You, you have these techniques, you learn energization, you learn Hong Sa, you learn Om. You may take Kriya, you may take discipleship, but you don't have, you don't have a guidebook. And especially given that everybody has different realities, I mean, what to speak of different countries that we live in and different cultures and different family responsibilities and different uh, professions and different geography and different traffic patterns. You know, it's just like nothing in, in Los Angeles, and it's the same song here, you know, there's the, the chant, desire, my great enemy. We, I say geography is our great enemy. Because <laughs> if you live on the opposite side of LA from our center, or if you live on the opposite side of Delhi from our center, geography, my great enemy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> with its traffic, is surrounding me. <laughs> it's giving me lots of trouble, oh my lord. <laughs> and it really is, so we can't say. We can't say you'll go to hell if you don't get here on time on Thursday because you might not, you might already be in hell trying to get here, you know. It's like, it just, it can't work that way. And it, when I, I read some Catholic text, I didn't grow up with that. You know, it's like once you start down the, the, the pathway of defining it externally, you have to define it right down to the end. Because as Swami said, once you tell people that they have to do certain things or else they'll be damned, the natural human tendency is, how much can I get away with? You know, when, when do I cross the line? And so then you have to start actually defining when you'll cross the line. And so 
as I understand it, the Catholics have, you know, the, whatever there are, small sins, big sins, mortal sins, and you get condemned or not condemned. And it's comforting because you can, you know where you stand. Self-realization, you never know where you stand. <laughs> really, you never do. You don't even know what the test is sometimes. Sometimes you think that to, you know, to succeed at what you're doing externally is to succeed. And sometimes what you really need to learn to do is fail. You just you have no idea. But the only thing you know is that there's a vibration that we're trying to tune into. And that when you begin to sort of know what that vibration is, then that alone is your compass. And no one else can tell you that. However, Swamiji does say, that vibration has certain observable characteristics. And in that pamphlet he writes very sweetly, he said that, you know, the people of Ananda, uh, well, well, what happened was, these friends in Los Angeles said something to him about um, that they could always tell someone from Ananda. And Swami said, that's odd because they, they're such an eccentric lot <laughs> because the closer you get to your own point of origin, the more you, you just are yourself. And he said, yes, except he said, and then Swami started thinking about it, and the man actually put some of these. He, and then Swami put it this way. He said, uh, uh, how did, what were the exact words? Well, humility, kindness, an open-mindedness, you know, to new ideas. And then he had a few others. And then he also had the phrase, a certain inner radiance, which was a very sweet way to put it. But the humility, the kindness, and an open-mindedness, you know, it's just, these are the things that happen when you're in tune with this particular ray. And Swamiji himself just exemplified this. Swami took himself so lightly. That's the only way I could say it. He just took himself lightly. Even when, you know, he was in places where as happened at the end of his life, especially in this country, but also in America, where hundreds of people were clustering around and he had such a, a, a stature in so many ways. He just never allowed it to actually affect him. He described, in fact, he described it. He said, the myth of Kriyananda swirls around me, is how he put it. He said, but inside I'm just the same old soul meaning I'm just a child of God, I'm just master's disciple. All of whatever happens around me, it doesn't mean anything to me. And Jyotish, who's his successor, it's exactly the same. We just take this for granted. You know, they're humorous, they're unpretentious, uh, they take themselves lightly, they have, they're kind. There's a certain inner radiance there, they're open-minded. That's the culture of Ananda. What you're looking at, you're looking at the, the individuals who exemplify it, but what you're looking at is you're looking at the vibration that is Ananda. And so we, when we're drawn to this, I mean, we might pick up autobiography of a yogi and know he belongs to us. Or in my case, I met Swami Kriyananda and I just knew he was mine. And people have felt, felt many people have felt the same way about Swamiji. You know, you just know it's mine. But just as many people are drawn to Ananda because they like the people of Ananda. It's like, who are these people? Where do they come from? Even honestly, when we take our children, who are, for the most part, not at all associated with Ananda, they're not Ananda families. Ours is a, it's a private school that we run in that area, and the parents bring their children for many different reasons. But we take those children out on the street, to, on field trips or wherever we take them. And people say, who are these children? Because they have a kindness and they have a certain inner radiance about them and they're open and they take themselves lightly, you know, all of these qualities. And what, when we, when, if you want to know what a spiritual path is, it's, it's hard to evaluate a guru unless you're a guru. The uh, reporter today asked me several questions about self-realization and I told her I would let her know when I know, you know. <laughs> It's just like, these are not questions I can answer. I can talk about what it's like to go toward it, but I don't know what happens when you get there, because I'm not there. So you can have an intuition about Swamiji or about Master or Babaji or any of these, but they're hard to evaluate. But you can look at people around, who, especially people who are dedicated, who have followed the path for a while. That's what it is. That's what it looks like. And if that's who you want to be, 
then, then you need to walk the path that they're walking. And so that, you begin to, to feel it and see it. You know, it's, when, when I first moved to uh, the Palo Alto area from Ananda Village, we didn't really have, Ananda Village was Ananda. We didn't say Ananda Village because there was just Ananda. And it was only after we started getting the community in Palo Alto and a, and a community in Ocean Song, which we had at that point. We had a house in San Francisco, but still Ananda was the village. And then it had to be Ananda Village because Ananda Palo Alto, Ananda San Francisco, and so on. Let's see, oh yes. So when we first moved there, it was sort of like how much of, of Ananda Village can we replicate in this place? And I actually tried to sit down and tried to make a list of all the things that actually constituted the culture of Ananda. And one of them was P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> because Swamiji would read us P.G. Woodhouse stories like we were little children. I know he did it here too. He would just read us P.G. Woodhouse and you would think, at first, you would think, depending on who you were, what does this have to do with Kriya Yoga? <laughs> you were thinking of, you know, I'm here to get Kriya, and, and my teacher is reading me P.G. Woodhouse, and just, you know, having to stop because he's laughing himself silly in the middle of the story with these weird accents and these strange characters. It, the, the recordings of him reading are on the internet, and they are really worth listening to. I have actually spent periods of time just listening to them over and over because they're just so delightful. Master's actual recipe, master's recipe for spiritual life is to read one funny story a day. I mean, master was setting the tone right there. Take yourself lightly. You know, be, be joyous in this. But especially at that time when our culture was really small, there were a lot of um, phrases from the P.G. Woodhouse book that were just books, that were just part of our vocabulary. One of them was there's this story about uh, Bertie, I'm not gonna tell the whole plot, but Bertie gets himself and he, he has to give a speech in front of a girl's school and he doesn't know what to say, so he starts telling off-color jokes. I mean, he never, P.G. Woodhouse is too clean, so you never actually get there, but when you start, you know, with the movie producer and the chorus girl, you have an idea of where the story's gonna go. <laughs> so Woodhouse, uh, Bertie is beginning to tell these girls this story that begins with the movie producer and the chorus. And so then the school director stands up and says, we will now sing the school song, <laughs> you know, and cuts him off. <laughs> and all over Ananda, whenever things got a little dicey, someone would say, we'll now sing the school song. <laughs> and those in the know would just crack up laughing. We knew exactly what it meant. And those not in the know would feel left out and think that they were nuts, you know, like there was some deep principle here that they'd miss. <laughs> Was it level one? Was, was it maybe in level three? Was it a higher Kriya? You know, like they didn't know what it was. And I realized that people had to have a certain familiarity with P.G. Woodhouse to be in tune with Ananda. Now, of course, that isn't exactly true, but it's almost true. You know, you have to just have a, an appreciation. And Swami was so pleased because, of course, the Indians loved P.G. Woodhouse, and he was so delighted that it was just already here. He had to introduce the Americans to him, at least us, you know, we just weren't schooled in it. But the point was, take yourself lightly, have fun, enjoy, don't take life so hard, um, and just be able to flow with the energy. Now, being able to know what it means, we will now sing the school song, is pretty trivial, but what it represents about having a shared reality, you know, the, the other aspects of Ananda culture are tremendously creative and, and a deep devotion to the arts. And that's why learning to sing Swami's music, because it both reflects consciousness and it creates consciousness. And it isn't familiar to, to, to you all yet, because it's something new. And there's something, to me at least, because I've now watched both here and in... Uh, Noida, I guess it was, where the, there was a, uh, was it Noida? Yeah. Well, Janik, Janik Puri, that's where it was. Um, <coughs> where there was a, uh, the choir also. And I, I don't know how to exactly to put it, but I can see, I can see everyone is trying to sing it. And, and in America, we had to learn to sing too. Um, the, the style of singing, well, the style of singing wasn't familiar to us either. 
Because people had sung uh, rock and roll, which is what people sang at that time. So most of the people who played the guitar and sang it, you know, been doing something really different. <laughs> or else they were singing folk songs. And folk songs are nice, but they're, uh, they're not as high energy for the most part. And so all of a sudden, the, they had to sing very exactly. They couldn't, Swami was very particular about the notes and the rhythm. And the words, you know, you, you can't swear, give life your heart, bless everything that's grown, fear not the loving, all this world's your own, make rich the soil, um, but whatever the phrase is, but once the seed is, once sown, the is sown, sown, seed is sown, Seek freedom, don't linger, go on alone. You can't sing that like, Seek freedom, don't linger, <laughs> go on alone. You know, it's just, you can't do that. You had to, people had to rise to that level. And it wasn't really just musically, although there was a lot. Now it's not that important. I mean, I know you all are working at it. It's, he had to establish the fact that this is an exact reality and you need to actually do it. And then people had to learn to be able to say those words with, with conviction. And I, and I want to I use the phrase without embarrassment. Because, you know, they're very elevated. Uh, they had to put across these very high ideals without in any way uh, being embarrassed by it. You know, because it's not popular these days to be so noble in your sentiments and to put forward such a powerful possibility. And so all of the singers had to really work at it, just as I see you all working at it. You're working at it from cultural, musical issues also, but it's really, that song is, those, that music is a specific vibration. And it's both in the words and the melody, and you need to match it. When our singers were first starting, Swami would interrupt them in the middle of the song. You know, they would be singing at a satsang. No, he would say, and then they just have to stop. <laughs> And he would, because, you know, he would correct the rhythm or he would correct some, he wasn't unkind, but he was emphatic. And some people in the audience were very uncomfortable with that. The singers didn't mind at all. They were just thrilled. He said, basically, practice makes permanent. And I don't want you to reinforce your mistakes. I want you to do this exactly as I intended, because this is a specific vibration and you need to match it. So there's been, so you all are 50 years down the line. The music was there from when we started. So now there's a lot of momentum behind this. It's not just coming from nowhere. But all of these things are to really understand this is a revolution. This is a revolution in spirituality, and we can't just fall back into what we've always known, what we've always thought. You know, here it's a little bit about the fact that a lot of these concepts are familiar, but they're not because Master reinterpreted and re-expressed it and rescued it, and then Swami made it all extremely precise. So we have to really understand exactly what we mean by all these terms, because that's all part of getting it into the... And Swami was very precise about everything. The way he wrote, he was very precise, and what he <coughs> asked of us in terms of our understanding. It's a very high-energy path. You know, that's the other culture of Ananda. It's a very high energy path. And people enter into it to the extent that they're able to do it, but it, it takes a lot from us to really be on this path. You can't just sleep your way through it. You can't just go to church or go to temple or pay the pujari and have him do the mantras and then call yourself a self-realizationist. You just either are or you aren't or you are on the path to it, and we all do it as well as we can. And then, so there's a certain, I, I would call it just a joyous enthusiasm about the adventure of what we're doing. I asked Swamiji many years ago, it's a famous question now, and I was the one who asked it, what is the purpose, what is the mission of Ananda? I said, and I think it was partly because I was so over-serious and I wanted some big over-serious answer. Swami said, to have fun. <laughs> Just like that, which caused everyone to laugh, you know, because we expected something different. The whole room laughed rather considerably for a little while. And when we finally stopped, Swamiji said, but then you have to understand what, what is fun for us and he said, what is fun for us is to be in tune with Divine Mother and then to share her bliss with everyone. 
And that's what I've always remembered. That's what fun is. In the, in the course of the years, many years that I've been doing this, and especially since I was responsible, became responsible with others for the building of the Palo Alto community, you know, we had to support ourselves with what we were doing. Ananda, no, every Ananda enterprise is autonomous. And, you know, we were just sent out, you know, go forth and multiply, but, you know, no, there's no money coming with it, so you're going to have to make it work yourself. There was a small, uh, something was already established. It wasn't from the desert sands. But we had to support ourselves, and we wanted to build, make things happen. So, you know, you naturally, how many people are in the room, and you're, how many adding up the class fees and just figuring out where you are, you have to think like that. You have to be practical. But I realized early on, one, in my position, I couldn't count the number of people in the room. I couldn't be standing there being disappointed because there are only 12 instead of 20, or there are only three instead of six, which there often were only three, and like that. That the only thing that really mattered was to have an inspiring experience, whatever the context was, whether it was kirtan, meditation, discourse, whatever it was. We just needed to create an inspiring experience that we all enjoyed together. Because if we did that, we were doing what we came to do. And if we did that, it would create a, a magnetism that would draw other people into it. And if it was just three people, who cares? If three people, three of us had a wonderful time together, you know, where it, you just, all you can be all by, by all, be all by yourself, God is always present. And when other people later would ask me, you know, what the job of a, a community leader, and I would just say to, to, to have fun by experiencing Divine Mother, by creating inspiring experiences. And in the early years of Ananda, we were very fortunate because we were so small and we were so isolated that everybody always knew where everybody was. <laughs> and very few of us had cars, and we were out in a rural area. I mean, here you guys can drive off and nobody knows where you've gone. <laughs> there, you were, you were there. And if you weren't, if there was an event and you weren't there, you know, somebody would go to your trailer to find out if you died the night before. I mean, we just didn't, you know, why would you not be there? It was that, some people didn't like that, but others of us were quite comfortable with it. I remember actually the moment after I'd been there about a month, when I realized that everybody in the community knew everything about me because I was very intuitive and I could read the people around me and I realized, oh my God, they can read me too. And I, I sort of, I have this physical memory of where I was standing when that crossed my mind. I was standing in the little connecting link between the kitchen and the dining room and there was sort of a bulletin board there and I was looking at the bulletin board and I just, I thought either <coughs> I surrender 100% to this. And from this time forward, just, you know, what you see is what you get, and that's where it's at from now on, or else I was going to have to leave. That there was no, there was nothing in between. I mean, it's still true with the Sangha. You don't have to live in an isolated small place. We all know each other, and that's the good news. You know, you're among friends, and that's what's happening. But uh, then, it, you know, if you didn't show up, it, I mean, it was actually a question of serious concern because you could be out there in your little trailer and you might be near death and no one would know it. Um, but that also meant that nothing happened unless you came, meaning the events depended on everybody being there. So from a very early age, I would say, say to, so to speak, we all felt responsible for creating it. And even though Swamiji himself was the one who was doing most of the leading during those early years, we all felt responsible for creating it. If we didn't come and meditate, if we didn't come and chant, if we didn't come and listen, it didn't exist because it was just us. And so it forged in us a wonderful responsibility for the vibration, which, which, which spiritually speaking, was very, very... Uh, maturing yeah because it wouldn't it wouldn't it, it it was ours that's what I'm trying to say and I think that's if we're going to talk about the culture of Ananda it's ours and the problem is we actually exist a little bit now 
Like, here's this beautiful ashram house. I've been living here for the last, whatever, 10 days. I love going up and down the stairs. I love coming out of my room, going down two flights of stairs and opening the door to the temple. It's just like, I love it. I love the fact that, that there's breakfast and lunch and dinner. <laughs> you know? I love the fact that I and Keshua, two of my dearest friends in the world, I just, it's like three feet out my door. Hello, are you guys home? You know, <laughs> all of everything. I love looking at the mortis out the window. I love every part of it. But when it, now that it actually exists, you might think that it exists without you. You might think that it has an independent life. You might think that you can come and go and it doesn't matter. Whereas when there was nothing, when we were literally meeting under a tree, there was no possibility that it existed. There was just us. And we knew that the only thing there was was the vibration we created together. Now in Palo Alto, we have a, a big temple. It was a Catholic church. It's a beautiful big temple. It's really there. And so people think they can come and go and it doesn't matter. Or that somehow that temple has anything to do with what Ananda is. And it's what I, I try to say to people, this, this temple is nothing. This is just because we have a, this huge indoor space, we can dance, we can sing, we can do theater, we can do all this wonderful stuff that's just marvelous. But it, it, Ananda doesn't exist. This building is not us. It's us, period. And, and that's also, you see, that was Swamiji's, this is the last thing I'll say, very distinct from SRF. And it's, this is part of the theological difference between the two. SRF is a traditional YSS. It's a traditional, well, in, in, in America, we'd speak, it's a very Catholic organization. You have the, the hierarchy, it's very clear. And now that we wear blue, I can't say anymore because they all have their colors too. Before, we didn't have any colors. But they all have their colors and you know where everybody stands and your, your authority is related to your position and people assume that if you're in certain colors, you're more advanced. You know, it's just a lot like that. And um, when we were in huge controversies with SRF at, at various times, and I would at times trying to communicate with the members, their members, you know, your organization is doing these things, their response would be, well, if the board of directors thinks it's fine, it's fine. I would say, well, you know, it's your money, it's your organization. Well, if the board of directors thinks it's fine. In one of those conversations, I just said, well, we were trained differently. And it's not that Ananda does not honor spiritual authority because that's obvious on a path of self-realization, a discipleship path. Of course, you're going to, you have to pay attention to authority. You have to pay attention to wisdom when it's presented to you. But Ananda is not run by position. This came to me recently. Position has nothing to do with the way Ananda, Ananda is run by spiritual magnetism. And magnetism is also created by a willingness to take responsibility. So what you have in Ananda is you have people who are willing to take responsibility, who generate magnetism by what they're doing. They may also have position, but it is not position that gives them authority. Because there's one more part of that. Every single individual has the same potential relationship with the guru. And your relationship with the guru is not determined by position. It is not determined by whether you're a householder, a monastic, a swami, a brahmachari. It is whether or not you are in tune and whether or not you are devoted. And that, that's just, that's a revolution. When spirituality had been in the hands of the pujaris, and they're the only ones who know the system, my Indian friend said, Hinduism is the only religion you pay people to practice for you, which I thought was a very apt way to put it, you know, <laughs> because nobody knows how to practice it except these certain professionals, so you pay them to practice it for you. Hmm, there's something a little odd about that. In the Catholic Church, you follow the rules, and then you're saved or damned, depending on what you've done, you know. But in self-realization, it's just between you and God. I mean, you can show up in heaven with all of your vestments on, you know, and you're not going to get in the door unless you're vibra vibrating in that way. And then therefore authority can come from wherever it comes from. 
And uh, I've also noticed it in and on. It's very, very interesting. At a certain point, I had this project to do. And this one woman wanted, she wanted to have authority. It's very funny. She had talent. She had capability. But she didn't have magnetism. She just, she was cursed, actually. It was a karmic curse. So she was, most of the time, she was right. But nobody ever listened to her. So it just drove her crazy. Uh, abuse of power in past lives brings you to that position. And that was her problem. I had a th more. I had more authority than she. I had more position than she did. So she wanted me to make people listen to her. <laughs> she wanted me to set up a system in which everyone had to listen to her. I told her, you know, honey, you underestimate your brothers and sisters. I could set an, up an airtight system, and they would find a way around it. I know these people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they will listen to you if you have the magnetism to give them something they want, and that's the fantastic part of Ananda. And that's all that exists, is the inspirational magnetism, period. And it belongs to everyone. And that is also the culture of Ananda. It's just, it runs purely. And I've watched it now for 50 years. I didn't know what was going to happen when we started branching out. It's incredible. It replicates everywhere. If the magnetism is there, if people are willing to take responsibility, that becomes the definition of what it is. And you know, for that reason, it's so much fun. <laughs> It really is. It's, it's just been the funnest. I could hardly imagine a life like this. I hoped for it, but I didn't know. So that is the, you know, what is the purpose of Ananda? To have fun. And boy, can we ever have fun? Like on a level you didn't know. I'm gonna, I, I lost a thread and I want to finish it here. I was talking about creativity, music, and so on. I was involved in a little political thing in the local county of Nevada County. We were trying to make Ananda into a California city. It's a fun story. It's in several of my books now, two of my books. Um, and so one of the, there was a man who was a local man who was part of this process. And so when Christmas time came, he invited this woman attorney and I who were working on this to come to his Christmas party, which was apparently in the little county, a big sort of, it was a big famous Christmas party. So we go to this Christmas party and we're in a, this big room and there's a piano, but we notice it's turned with its face against the wall. And we kind of look around, and there's, there's no, no provision for music. There's no provision for dance or theater or, or poetry or anything. We actually realize, and this may not be so shocking to you, but this was my life then, that all we were going to do was drink alcohol <laughs> until everybody got inebriated enough to think they were having a good time. And, you know, I don't drink. I haven't, I, I mean, when I was a teenager, I had a couple of drinks, but I just never drank. And we were, just, we were just there. We just sort of watched it begin to happen, my friend and I. It was just like, we felt so sad, you know? Because if it had been an Ananda party, there would have been 15 creative things that were going on that we were all doing at the same time to have fun together. So we waited till people started getting a little too drunk for, uh, for us to feel comfortable. And then we graciously said goodbye and went away. But that's also the culture of Ananda, is what I would call clean, bright entertainment and good, clean fun. <laughs> and a kind of childlike enthusiasm for all of that. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a family worth joining. And it's a story worth adding your chapters to. You know, it's a great adventure that has a long way to go. So, there you are. Thank you. <laughs>